One does not just hop a plane and leave for Greenland. First off, there are not that many flights, and secondly, one must prepare for this trip. One of the keys is proper clothing. The Schenectady Air National Guard provided me with one of the most protective coats made for the military. From the waist up, it covers just about everything and is much too warm for the chilly Capital District springtime climate. This kind of getup is not unusual for the 793 Air National Guard members who operate at the 109th flying out of Schenectady County Airport. 200 of the guardsmen are full-time employees, the rest are part-timers, so-called weekend warriors. This is our morning of departure, a mandatory briefing for everyone on this trip. There are two crews on two planes. Okay, I just want to go over a few things with you on this briefing. We're going to Goose, three hours and 15 minutes to the Goose. A quick run through of the flight plan from the mission commander, Lieutenant Colonel Tom Leonard, and then it's time to head to the ships. The planes will fly are C-130 transports, the largest planes in the world equipped with skis, and the planes working out of Schenectady are the only 130s with skis. Shortly before nine in the morning, we're off. Flight 94 is the first off the ground. We're on 93 and take off about 15 minutes later. Destination, Goose Bay, Labrador. The flight itself is far from flush. It is in a rough, vibrating airplane that seems to have no soundproofing at all. We have to use little foam earplugs in order to retain our hearing. The seats themselves are certainly less than airline quality. The C-130 is a cargo plane. It just so happens that people sometimes are cargo. Remember the Capital District in early April? A few patches of dirty snow, but new spring growth starting to sprout before our record April snow. Well, northeastern Canada wasn't quite there yet. Labrador, April 6th, piles of snow cover the pine forests. See that strip up ahead, the one with a black stripe down the middle? That's the airport at Goose Bay, Labrador, where we'll land for an hour to refuel, three and a half hours from Schenectady. The air is cold. Albany's forecast was for near 50 this particular day. Goose Bay at noon, 32. Maintenance people from the 109th were busy fixing a wheel well problem which developed an hour out of Schenectady, forcing us to drop quickly from 21,000 feet to 10,000 feet because of a loss of cabin pressure. The problem? A loose clamp. The crew actually had the problem figured out before we landed, but they had to get on the ground to be able to reach the problem. From this point, it's on to Greenland, over nearly a thousand miles of ocean. It's blue on the map, but in reality, it's miles and miles of frozen chunks of ice. The crew says the most ice they've ever seen here this late in the season. Then, off in the distance, our destination, Greenland. We spot the coast just before four capital district time. It's three hours later here. Looking at the land from the worn protection of a plane, it appears spectacular yet savage. Beautiful, but the kind with an unforgiving nature. It's there to see and challenge, yet one mistake in this land will claim you in its icy grip and quickly cover you with snow to restore its own beauty. How can anyone live here? Yet there's the capital, the largest community on this huge land. It's about the size of Kobelskill. From there, we fly up the coast and up a long fjord to the place we'll call home for the next few days. This is a place called Sandrastrom. When we arrived on April 6th, at 5 p.m. Capital District Time, the temperature, one degree above zero. It's from this forbidding place that the 109th from Schenectady operates on the Greenland ice cap. More on what they do and why, starting tomorrow. Jack Arnicky, New Center 6, in Sandrastrom. Getting to Sandrastrom on the southwest coast of Greenland is only half the battle facing the Raven Gang. They are the only Air National Guard unit in the country with a regular mission. Theirs is flying ski birds out onto the Greenland ice cap. There's no concrete out there. The skis on the bottom of the plane are the landing gear. The plane service two defense early warning radar sites or dew line sites. Landing on snow is nothing like landing on pavement. It's a hairy experience. First, there is nothing to see but endless white. Radar must be used to find a dot in thousands of miles of snow. Getting down is not textbook flying, it's seat of the pants flying. Let's go down, following the conversations of the flight crew. There's a speedway right there ahead of you, Graham, but take a look and see the angle. I don't think we can make it. Okay, I've got a good view of it. All right. uh, how long, far are we down at that? Uh, we just started the edge here. Okay, we're too far down the speedway. Crew, we're going around. Okay, go around. We were off quite a bit, not uh, enough to be concerned, and the wind blew us across, and we were just looking down at the skiway, and we elected to go around. 
Lieutenant Colonel Tom Leonard, the mission commander, was co-pilot on this flight. If at first you don't succeed, you gotta try again. Yeah, take a peek out, Graham. You'll see the flags coming along. Get, okay. get back in again. All right. One eight zero. Okay. Pull out a little bit here. Let's All get right. to the skiway. Okay. Come on out. The skiway is right ahead, about eleven forty-five. The pilot is visual. Okay. Good. Nice snow. The snow conditions were excellent today. The temperature is about zero, and uh, it, uh, there was some fresh snow, but it had been packed, and it, it was an excellent uh, skiway, and everything was in good shape. Still, the runway feels more like moguls than smooth skiway. Our destination is a 10-story building in the middle of nowhere, home to 15 to 20 men the year round, and the tons of sophisticated and top-secret radar equipment inside. And the place where this sits is almost a scene from science fiction. Standing right here on this snow gives one an unbelievable sense of history and magnitude. You don't realize it from this particular point, but from where I am standing, the snow is over 7,000 feet deep. Snow that fell at the time that Caesar was emperor of Rome is underneath my feet down there somewhere. And the snow here just does not melt. It never gets warm enough to melt. It just keeps building and building and building. There are some places on this large island of Greenland where the snow is 10,000 feet thick. After about a half an hour on the ground in deteriorating weather conditions, we ski off back to Sandrastrom. I think that's the best we're going to get. That's about, I think this is ice rock that's coming in on us. Okay, here we go. Tomorrow, a report on what the Raven Gang carries to the lonely places on the ice. Jack Arnicky, News Center 6, flying over the Greenland ice cap. A plane on the ground does not mean lack of activity. When the Raven Gang members are not flying, they're getting ready to fly. When we flew to Sandrastrom with the first contingent of the spring, the planes carried huge loads of materials the 109th might need in Greenland, including a spare engine. Ice cap landings can be treacherous. We were successful in ours, but not all are. Planes or parts of them have been lost. So far, no people. The dew line sites get food and other day-to-day -day supplies on smaller twin-engine ski planes. The C-130s from Schenectady take out the big stuff. Involved are not only weight factors, but making all those things fit in a flyable order. That's the job of the plane's loadmaster, in our case, a part-time guard member, Dick Phillips, who has a very different job with the State Transportation Department. Mainly uh, crash testing of highway barriers uh, during the summer season. No one wants a crash test here. Just what is a loadmaster? We load the aircraft before flight, uh, responsible for the weight and balance, uh, fly with the aircraft as a crew member, and then at our destination we offload the aircraft. We've put together a couple of different loads to give a fairly representative picture. This is an unusually small load for the C-130. There'll be much larger loads later on in the summer. But the stuff is brought here to die two and die three, supplies which are needed to keep this place going. The heavier equipment is put on huge sleds and pulled to the radar building by bulldozer or other vehicle used to get around out there. These structures were all brought out by the C-130s piece by piece nearly 30 years ago. They sink a little more into the ice cap every year, so the Raven Gang brings out new parts of stilts or pillars, and the buildings are jacked up a few feet, allowing enough room for the snow to blow underneath and avoid being drifted in. After years of sinking, the sites are moved. The Air Guard brings out mobile homes for work crews and yards of girders and other equipment, and the site is rolled a couple of hundred yards to new footings. It's all very sophisticated. Yet here's the water supply. The bucket dropped to the snow on a cable. It's filled with snow and then melted inside. The sites are powered by a half dozen diesel generators. That's another Raven Gang job. Back to Sandrastrom, where these large tanks are one of the keys to powering the sites. They are specially made for the C-130s. Those large tanks that were just pushed into the airplane are now going to be filled with diesel fuel, and that fuel is going to be taken out to one of the two dye sites. This is really the way they get their fuel for heating, for electricity, and so on. It's interesting, though, that the fuel that will be going into those tanks will actually have been here for a year. Since the fuel, 300,000 gallons a year, sits on ice, it has to be stored in huge tanks on the ground at Sandrastrom for a year to make sure it's colder than 32 degrees. Otherwise, it would melt its way into the ice cap. The fuel is delivered by plane to domed storage buildings. The fuel comes out in 100 loads for the year, 200 flights for the two dew line sites regularly serviced by the air guard. Incidentally, while on the ground, the plane's engines are kept running constantly because there are no heaters to warm them up to starting temperature, as there are in normal landing places. 
This was a bad day on the ice. A frozen valve at the storage tanks prevented offloading. A broken nose ski prevented takeoff with a full diesel load. With fuel running desperately low on the plane, the crew used the only alternative it had, dumping the 3,000 gallons on the ice. After that, our takeoff succeeded, and it was back to warmth in Sandrastrom. Tomorrow, a look at the little town with a tongue twister name. Jack Arnicky, News Center 6 in Greenland. Greenland is the largest island in the world. It is Danish. Most of Greenland is ice cap. The size is second only to Antarctica. 650,000 square miles of snow and ice, two miles thick at its deepest point. If it all melted, the world's oceans would rise 23 feet. The ice cap comes to an end about 25 miles from shore, breaking up in huge mountains of ice that look from the air very much like neatly plowed rows of white earth. And around the edge is sparse habitation. A couple of days ago, we showed you the largest town, Gothab, the capital. Population, 8,000. The Raven Gang's northern home is considerably smaller. For the past couple of days, we've told you about the 109th and what they do. Now we'll show you where they stay, where they hang out. This is Sandrastrom, all of it. Actually, a rather typical community along the coastline of Greenland. In fact, Greenland's population, the whole island of Greenland's population, is about 50,000, just about the size of the population of Troy. Sandrastrom is on the Sandrastrom Fjord, meaning southern river. It is relatively ice-free in mid and late summer, allowing shipping. In summer, the dry bushes and grasses, I'm told, grace beautiful Arctic wildflowers, which grow on the upper edge of the melted four-foot-thick permafrost. The plants provide food for the limited wildlife, mainly caribou, which graze in small groups, along with musk ox, arctic fox, and lots of ravens, from which the raven gang takes its name. Sandrastrom has some entertainment, a movie, a gym. The Air Force runs a small radio station, which serves only the 1,600 people at Sandrastrom, and a TV station with one live show a day, the 6 o'clock news. There's no glamour. From here, the anchor man rushed out to be a waiter for dinner at the officer's club. When you're in a place as remote as Sandrastrom, you sort of need a place where you can hang your hat, a place where you can call home. Well, this is the home for the 109th. This is called the Raven's Roost, named after their nickname, the Raven Gang. The Raven's Roost at one time was a condemned building on this base, but the 109th took it over and made it home away from home. The supplies were brought up on a space available basis on the planes over a two-year period. Lumber, nails, and so on. All of the labor came from 109th members during their off time. The artwork is from a member of the 109th. And there is a taste of home. The roost is a place for saying, phew, after a cold and busy day. This is the place to sleep, the appropriately named Arctic Hotel. The rooms are not plush, two to a room, facilities down the hall. No, there is no swimming pool, but you can't expect much for $4 a night. Still, with this stark neighborhood, it's easy to see why the primary causes of death in Greenland are alcoholism and suicide. Yet there is something which draws you to this place, a fascination after you've been here, even when you don't have to come back. Tomorrow, a look at why some of the Raven Gang members keep coming back. Jack Arnicky, News Center 6 in Sandrastrom. We arrived here on April 6th. We leave Saturday, April 9th. For two days, videographer Grant Dobbins and I flew out onto the Greenland ice cap. Both days, weather conditions were marginal, and we had only about a half an hour each day on Thursday and Friday of actual time at the Dewline site, Die 2. Like an appetizer, it created a desire to experience more. Frankly, when I started, I thought once would be enough. Looking from the Die site, one sees endless wind-blown white. Seeing this, one really appreciates those who came before struggling on foot and with dog sleds in a land with no landmarks. My impression is a first one. Some Raven Gang members have flown here for eight years. Yes, it's a job, but no one is twisting any arms to join the guard or stay in. In the Raven's Roost, I asked several their thoughts of Greenland. Many show a love-hate relationship. This is not paradise, but it is a challenging place. Well, you saw us today. We're having fun. And this is the last of the good time flying, I believe. It's a great place to visit. I don't want to live here. I think it's a great place to be from. It's my vacation away from home. It's different, different culture. Nice place to visit. Quite a contrast between what I've seen in the United States, uh, the Arizona desert and, and in New York, the East Coast. It's just no place like it in the world. The whole Air Force envies us, really. Mm -hmm. When they, they know about our mission, then they come up and look at us. 
What do you think of Greenland? Nice place to visit, but I wouldn't want to live here. It's very, very cold, and I don't like the cold weather. Seeing a coastline in Greenland, as I'm sure you saw, it's uh, probably a once-in-a-lifetime experience. It's a beautiful place to visit for a short time, but there's no guamki and no kielbasa here. <laughs> So for eight months of the year, there are at least two ski birds here, and 793 people from the Capital District spend time on duty using a $15 million annual budget, primarily for this mission, although there are others. There is the challenge of the place and the enjoyment of flying, and as a poem about flyers indicates, there is an attraction with seeing a place like Greenland from up there. I have slipped the surly bonds of earth and danced the skies on laughter silvered wings. Sunward I've climbed and joined the tumbling mirth of sun-split clouds and done a hundred things you would not have dreamed of, wheeled and soared and swung. High in the sunlit silence, hovering there, I've chased the shouting wind along and flung my eager craft through footless halls of air. Up, up, the long, delirious, burning blue, I've topped the wind-swept heights with easy grace where never lark or even eagle flew. And while, with silent, lifting mind, I've trod the higher, untrespassed sanctity of space, put out my hand, and touched the face of God. <laughs>